Those of you that are maybe visiting this morning, I see a couple of new faces. We want to say very welcome here at the Rock Church in Squamish. It's great to have you with us. My name is Rudy Botha. I am one of the elders here at the Rock Church. Uh, it's coming up to, it's now almost three and a half years that I've been in leadership and in the elder year at the Rock, uh, serving together with Glenn and uh, a bunch of other guys. Uh, those of you that do not know yet, uh, we did announce it some time ago at the end of January that I was stepping down from the associate pastor role. Uh, that uh, is basically an expectation of what God has put in my heart uh, for something new in this coming season that is not necessarily going to be in that pastoral role. Uh, we're not entirely sure what that is, but we're praying and we're looking forward to that. And, um, and so thus being an elder, I am still in that role of leadership and being called to preach and teach. And so I have the privilege to do that this morning. Um, listen, I want to start off by talking about something that happened, and it's a, a, a very significant event uh, that happened on February 8th in the small town of Wilmore, Kentucky, USA. How many of you know what I'm talking about by showing your hand? Okay. Uh, for those of you that do not know this, uh, Wilmore, Kentucky, or Wilmore in Kentucky, is a very small town of about 6,000 people. And it's the home to uh, a Christian university with the name of Asbury University, where there is a seminary. And something happened there that word of mouth got out via social media, mainstream media, and thousands of people started flocking to this town in the last couple of weeks. Now, what had happened was they had their usual chapel service. Uh, they had their songs that they sang. Uh, they had their preacher come and preach. Many people described that message as one of the most unprepossessing messages on Romans 12. Nothing special about it. Um, and in the end, there was a call to linger around, stay for prayer and worship. I think they would end with a couple of songs. But then... A couple of students were still hanging around, uh, feeling that the Holy Spirit was impressing on their hearts to, to repent, to enjoy God's presence, to enjoy His love, His mercy, and they didn't leave. Then what happened was the other students at the university heard of this. They went back to the chapel and... Worship continued. The end result was that the chapel service didn't end for two weeks. They were worshiping for two weeks straight on that campus and in that chapel. Now, many have now responded, and initially when this happened, it was called the Asbury Revival or Awakening. But the Asbury University's president, Dr. Kevin Brown, has responded, and, and they've officially put this on the website. They call it an outpouring. That is their formal acknowledgement of what they believe has happened, that God did a magnificent thing in that place through an outpouring. But what has been interesting for me in the last couple of weeks is to have listened and read and watched certain responses out of the Christian community about the Asbury revival or outpouring. On the spectrum of the evangelical Christianity, where you have on the one side maybe hyper-charismatic and on the other side hyper-neo-Calvinist, super-reformed, it's been interesting. There's been both optimism, enthusiasm, openness, but then there's also been judgment, cynicism, and skepticism about what has happened there. And so this morning, I, I don't want to cast any judgment or, or specifically just look at what happened there. I want to ask us as a church, that term, outpouring, what is that? What does that look like? Is that perhaps something that we as a church 
are being prepared for in this season. And, uh, and I'm asking that, looking at the correlation. You know, we are now in a month of prayer and fasting. Um, and so that is a question on my mind. And I was led in these past two weeks as I was praying, you know, in this season of us embarking on this prayer and fasting. What is it that the Lord wants to do? And so in order for us to answer this question, what an outpouring is, I'm going to take us to the book of Numbers of all places in the Old Testament. I'm going to start off there and then we'll be jumping back and forth between that and the book of Acts and specifically Acts chapter 2. But if you can turn in your Bibles to Numbers, the book of Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Numbers is the fourth book, right? So chapter 11 and we're going to read verses 16 to 30. I won't be putting it up there. We're going to read it together. Sorry, I forgot my water bottle. Is my water bottle there next to you, John? Maybe, uh, sorry, I'm just going to grab that. Thank you. Now, before we read, I want to give a bit of context what the situation is here. Um, the nation of Israel, God's people... We're held captive in Israel, uh, in Egypt, sorry. They're not in Israel yet. They're in Egypt and they were there for 400 years. And then they get set free by God through miraculous intervention. We see how God appoints a leader, Moses, and his brother Aaron to lead the people out. They cross the Red Sea with God performing a miracle, uh, parting the way for them. He, he sends a strong wind and it, it opens up the Red Sea. Then they travel through the wilderness. God provides them with His law to guide them in their ways so that they will be separate from the nations around them. And then God provides for them in a miraculous way food through this weird thing called manna that falls out of the sky. And it's, you know, they, they say it tastes like wavers, kind of like in a little bit of sweetness, but they, they use that over a period of 40 years to kind of like make something that's kind of like bread. But then the people rebel. They are tired of the manna. They want meat. They say to Moses, listen, when we were in Egypt, uh, we really enjoyed the fish that came out of the Nile River, and we enjoyed specifically onions and garlic, which is really interesting. They really long for onions and garlic. Um, and then they, they murmur, they complain, they groan. And Moses gets fed up, and he complains to God. He's like, listen, I've had enough of these people. They are, I didn't give birth to them. They are your chosen people. You might as well kill me. I'm done. I can't carry this leadership burden all by myself. And that brings us then to Numbers 11, verses 16 to 30, where we see the following. It says there, then the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand there with you. So bring them to the tabernacle. God gave them an instruction to, to build a tent of meeting, a tabernacle. The, the, before they had the temple, this tabernacle would travel with them, and that is where God's presence was. And I will come down and talk with you there, and I will take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you, so that you may not bear it yourself alone. And say to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of the law, saying, who will give us meat to eat? For it was better for us in Egypt. Therefore, the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. But they did not continue doing it. Verse 26, now two men remained in the camp named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. 
They were among those who registered, but they had not gone out to the tent of meeting. And so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? With that, all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Let us just pray before we carry on. Uh, Father, we just, we just thank you this morning again for your kindness, your goodness, your mercy and your grace. And Lord, that we can uh, experience that as we had sung through your spirit, your presence. We welcome you in this place. Uh, Lord, we just come and ask, come and examine our hearts and come and prepare us for what you want to do. And come and speak, for we are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Right, so uh, our sermon title, if you could put that up there on the next screen, is an outpouring. And I want to look at five questions this morning. What is an outpouring from God? What precedes an outpouring? What is the purpose of an outpouring? What are the fruits of an outpouring? And what are the hindrances? To an outpouring. The first question, what is an outpouring from God? Well, as we can see there in Numbers 11, an outpouring of God's Spirit is an act of God in which God sovereignly pours out His Spirit on His people as a result of His goodness, His kindness, His mercy, His grace. It is nothing that the people of God deserve. It's nothing that they do to work for it. It is a work of God's grace. We read about this outpouring of or outpouring of God's Spirit in Numbers eleven, and specifically after Moses complains to God about this burden of leadership. He cannot lead these people by himself, and so he is is at his end. He can't carry on anymore. And so by God's grace, God intervenes and says hold on, let's make a plan, Moses. Let me take some of my spirit, my power that is on you, and we select 70 elders to be empowered by my spirit. Now, this is, of course, a foretaste and a foreshadowing of what God was going to do in the ages to come after he's going to send his Messiah, his chosen servant that was going to suffer and die on the cross for the sins of the world. Because God also made a promise then, 800 years before Christ, through the prophet Joel, that what he was going to do in the last days is he was going to pour out his spirit on all flesh, male and female, old and young. They were going to prophesy, dream dreams, see visions. But that is as a result of God's grace. It's a result then, in the end, of God doing the work through Jesus Christ, his chosen Messiah. And that that would happen to those people that put their faith in Jesus, that repent of their sins and follow him faithfully. We see this being preceded with Jesus who had risen from the dead after he was crucified and after he had been in the grave for three days. He was now for 40 days with his disciples. And then he says this to them before he ascends into heaven. In Acts 1 verse 8, he says, you, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and in the end, or to the ends of the earth. Now, that word power, receive power, in the Greek, is the same word where we get dynamite from. And so when Jesus says, listen, you will receive power, it literally means like, listen, this is going to be powerful. And that is what we see happen in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. I'm just going to read this, those four verses. It says there, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. 
And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And if you go and read the, the chapter, what happens after that is, is that Peter preaches this sermon. The people are cut to the heart. And the church grows from 120 people to 3,000 within, I'm talking under correction, I think they say within a week. Like that. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. That's not a mega church strategy. That's not some kind of outreach strategy. That's not some kind of clever ways in which we try and reach the community. It is through the power of God, the presence of His Spirit. Now that for me is the clearest example of what we see, what an outpouring is. It's an act and a move of God which leads to souls being renewed, empowered for a purpose. And that is what we'll examine here with uh, point number three. Now, moving on to number two, you know, what precedes an outpouring from God? What happens before that? Is there something leading up to this? In Numbers 11, we have that situation again. Israel murmur, they complain, they are tired of, of everything, they are tired of Moses, they just want to get rid of him. And then Moses... Moses is the one who leads them and the burden of leadership, but he is the one who is brutally honest with God. He wrestles with God. Listen to what he tells God in Numbers 11, verses 11 to 15. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all the people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give them birth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give to their forefathers or fathers? Where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they weep before me and say, give us meat that we may eat. So he is rhyming, right? Okay. I am not able to carry all these people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight, that I may not see my wretchedness. How's that for brutal honesty towards the creator of heaven and earth? <laughs> how many of us, how many of you talk to God like that? And I think it's an example of how God is actually looking for us to have relationship with Him. Because what I see in that is it's a true relationship. It's a back and forth, right? Like we know if you go and read about Israel's journey, Moses time and time again wrestles with God, has these conversations, and he intercedes for God's people on many occasions. And so Moses basically prays. He intercedes again. He wrestles with God about these people. And, he, and he's just honest. He's not just reciting some prayer. And I feel like for me, if I look back at when God moved in my life in significant ways, it's really in seasons and in times when I am at my end too. When I am honest. And I'm like, God, I can't do this anymore. You called us here. You, you told us to do this. You're the one who's leading us. But, you know, and when I'm at my end, that is when all of a sudden God comes through. But then God commands then the people we see to consecrate themselves before He's going to perform the miracle of providing them meat and even before He pours out His Spirit on the new leaders. That's a big thing too. So Moses prays, he intercedes, and then consecration. What does it mean to consecrate yourself? It means to set yourself apart. And it, it normally goes alongside with prayer and fasting. And so we see the, the people of God in Acts 1 fo follow that kind of like same pattern where prayer is very much involved. In Acts 1 verse 14, it says there of the group of 120 that were gathering, all these were 
or, sorry, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. Together with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So once again, common denominator there is prayer. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, one of America's greatest preachers and leaders during the first great awakening of 1734, said this. When God has something very great to accomplish for his church, it is his will that there should precede it the extraordinary prayers of his people. And it is revealed that when God is about to accomplish great things for his church, he will begin by remark remarkably pouring out the spirit of grace and supplication. And so what I want to say with that is, is that historically, before God does something great and new in his church, it seems like the pattern is that prayer is one of those things that prepare the people. And consecration. In other words, to ready yourself for God. The third question there, what is the purpose then of outpouring or of an outpouring of God's Spirit? I want to identify two purposes. The first one out of Numbers 11 is plain and simple for us. The purpose is the empowerment of leaders, the empowerment of other people to take the burden of leadership off of Moses to help guide these people, to lead them through the desert and into the promised land. That is the first purpose. But a second purpose we do see, of course, in the book of Acts, it's also empowerment because God promised that he was going to give them power. We see in Acts 1 verse 8, is, it is to go. The purpose is not to receive power and just to keep it for yourself. It's not to receive the Holy Spirit and, and the light of the world within you and put that light under a bucket and hide it. But it is to go. That is what Jesus commanded his disciples. And that is what happened. We have a misconception many times when we read the book of Acts, and we think that the gospel mainly spread through the 12 apostles, and, and the apostle Paul was the main guy planting the churches. Listen, if you go read history, it is not necessarily just them. It, the majority of the spreading of the gospel happened with people like you and me, the dispersion, those who scattered after they were persecuted, they shared the gospel. We see this, for example, in Acts 8. After the persecution broke out against the church, those who were scattered, it says, they preached the message wherever they went. We see this example with Philip. He ends up in Samaria. Samaria is the most unlikely area and people group that they thought was going to reach or be reached with the gospel. And this is what happened in Acts 8, verse 14 to 17. It says, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, in other words, they believed the word of God, they believed the gospel, they put their faith in Jesus, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them. Notice that. They received the word of God, believed. But the Holy Spirit hadn't fallen yet on them. And notice the Holy Spirit is not an it. He's got a pronoun, he. Jesus called the Holy Spirit him. He will come to teach you. And it says they were only baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. The big idea is this, that out of those examples, the purpose of God's Spirit in us, poured out into our lives, is, yes, receive power. The power to be sanctified, to be set free from sin, to be set free from strongholds, to receive healing, to be revived, to have a relationship with God, but to go. There has to be a to go. Question four, then. What are the fruits of an outpouring? You could say that empowerment and going, yes, 
That's part of it. That, those are fruits too. But that, I would say overall that's the purpose. And out of our text today and in Acts, I want to highlight specific things mentioned that I think are vital as fruits for a sign that, listen, you have been filled with Holy Spirit and you are continually living a life in obedience to Christ and continually being filled to overflow by the Spirit. In Numbers 11, we see this happen in this way. Verse 25b, as soon as the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied. We see the manifestation of God's Spirit empowering the elders to prophesy. What does that mean? They were speaking the wonders of God. Proclaiming, God, you are good, you are gracious, you are compassionate, you are slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. You are the only true God, the, the God Yahweh who set us free from enslavement. And in verse 26, we see when the Spirit falls on Eldon and Medad, they were among those registered, but they didn't go out to the tabernacle. They didn't go to the tent of meeting, but the Spirit still fell on them, and it says they prophesied in the camp. And then we know Joshua wants to silence them, but Moses says, Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put His Spirit on them. Moses prophesies that, listen, this is actually what, this is superb. This is what God actually wants to do. And that was, of course, fulfilled again in the book of Acts, alongside with Joel's prophecy in Joel 2, that God was going to pour out His Spirit. In Acts 2, verse 5 to 6, this is what are the fruits are when the Spirit was poured out on the church. They were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak his own language. The Spirit fell on them. They start speaking in unknown languages. And the nations that are gathered there to worship God during the time of Pentecost, they hear this. In other words, it is prophetic. It's prophecy. If they were not able to understand it or if it wasn't interpreted, it would not be helpful for them. They say in verse 11, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. We see in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul say this about tongues and prophecy. He says, I want you all to speak in tongues. How often do you hear that in the church? <laughs> that Paul said, I want you all to speak in tongues. Okay, but that's not the full picture. What does Paul say? He says, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues. You hear that a lot. Keep quiet. No tongues. No other languages that are unknown. Hold on, hold on. That's not all what Paul said. He says, unless someone does what? Interprets. So that the church may be built up. In other words, when there is something that happens supernaturally when God's Spirit is poured out and there is a revelation that comes in an unknown manifestation in a language and it's interpreted, it is prophetic. It is prophecy. The church is built up. Paul encouraged the church to aspire to prophecy and speaking in tongues, unknown languages, to encourage the church to rely on his Spirit. And to be out of their comfort zone. But I think for me the question is, you know, why is it that people are built up then through prophecy? Well, first and foremost, it is a revelation received then about what God's will is and what God wants to do and what he is saying. So it's teaching. But then most of all, you know what I think it is? It is the body of Christ actually then coming together and it's not just one guy teaching and preaching. It's not just Rudy who's studying at seminary. It's not just the elders, but it's the body. It's people. It is the picture of God's church. Everyone is able to prophesy. Listen to Paul's language in that text. I want you all. In a different text, he says, all can prophesy, but there's order. There is a way in which it needs to happen. What is my big idea here? 
the fruit of the Spirit of God being poured out leads to a verbal exclamation of what God has done in your life. Put aside tongues and prophecy. You see in the book of Acts that verbally something changes, man. Your heart is changed and what is in your heart comes out of your mouth. You just can't keep it for yourself. You need to share it. You need to tell someone. There is a, a, a Canadian, a crazy Canadian I met five, six, seven years ago in South Africa. And he told me his story. He's got this amazing testimony of how he got saved while he was in prison. In prison, he, he walked past the library and he, and he heard a voice tell him, go look behind the one bookshelf. And behind that bookshelf, he found a Bible. <laughs> And he read the Bible, and he came to faith through reading the Bible. He started preaching the gospel in the prison. People get saved. And then on the day that he gets released from prison, he says, the first guy that he meets in the street, he grabbed him and he said, do you have time for a coffee? <laughs> and he took that guy for a coffee to Tim Hortons. He gave him the gospel, and he said that guy believed. You know, I listened to that when he told me that story, and it sounds like, what the heck? But you know what? It sounds like what's happening here. You've got to share it. You've got to go. But it's as a result of God doing the work within you. You are not the one doing it so that you can receive something. It's because of what you've received. A last question. What are the hindrances in in the example in Numbers eleven? We see Joshua. It says there in verse twenty eight, and Joshua the son of Nun, the assistant to Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? As if Moses is, is telling him, listen, you're not jealous for me. You're jealous because you're just jealous. You're envious of what's happening here. It's the same kind of reaction we see from Jesus' disciples in Mark 9, where they notice, listen, there's a group of disciples that's not part of us. They drive out demons. They go to Jesus. They say, Jesus, we need to stop those guys. They're not with us. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. He who is not against you is for you. Leave them. In Acts 2, verse 13, we see this reaction where the Spirit is poured out. The people around them said, or it reads there, but others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. Other translations say that these guys are drunk. So something was happening there after they got filled that made these people think that these guys are out of their mind. If you've seen a bunch of people that get together and they've had too much alcohol, it gets pretty loud. Okay, They they talk a lot. They share a lot. And what's ironic about that statement is, yes, they did receive new wine. (laughs) They did. In the form of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that you cannot have new wine in, in old wine sacks. They need to go in new, new wine sacks. New wine was going to be poured out. And so what I believe we see the hindrances are is just plain and simple. It's, it's jealousy. It's a spirit of envy. It's tribalism. Th- those guys are not on my denomination. They're not part of our church. It's brand loyalty. Yeah, it's not, it's not an outpouring. It's, it's uh, that church, that, that group. They are too, they, are too, uh, they water down the gospel. They're part of the Methodist movement or whatever. It is cynicism. It's skepticism. That is what hinders an outpouring. We read this. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 19 to 22, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. But test everything Hold fast to what is good. 
abstain from every evil. In 1 Corinthians 14, you can go and read at the end of that chapter, Paul walks the church through the order in which these things need to happen. Paul says, listen, when there's prophecy, only two or three guys need to prophesy. And then he says something very interesting. He says, listen, when one person is prophesying, weigh what's being said. So in other words, test it. The filter is the Bible, but test what's being said. And then Paul says, but if someone else sits there and gets a revelation, let the first guy who prophesied keep quiet, let the other guy talk. <laughs> it's, isn't it weird? It is spontaneous. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that happening here, that we have uh, George come up, he's prophesying, and we're like, okay, we're weighing what George is saying. And then Nick sits there, and he's like, hold on, I, got, I just got something. Uh, George, keep quiet, go sit down. Uh, Nick, come up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's done in a humble way, in a gracious way. It's done to say, hey, listen, we have guidelines. Why? What are we so scared of? <laughs> hey, George. <laughs> my, my main point is, Paul is saying to the church, listen, be open to what the Spirit is doing and saying. But yes, use your discernment. If people start barking like dogs and stuff like that, yeah, maybe that's not of God. Maybe get the person out. Help him. Okay, I don't know. But don't be scared of that. We do know in those instances, and it's the same with what has happened at Asbury. Yes, within all of those instances where you get people that are envious and and they want to take, they're prideful, they want to take the glory, you're going to find the enemy wants to come and sow seeds of discord in those areas. But that's why we as the church have the mind of Christ. We have been given the mind of Christ. We can discern through the Holy Spirit. Now, I didn't put the final question up there. The final question is just asking, so what? So what, Rudy? And before I end with answering that question, I really felt like I wanted to play this next video for us to to quickly watch, and then I'll, I'll talk after that. Lydia, if you can put it on. Any other stories come to mind? Just someone yeah. who's like had this like, huge like revelation, changing part of being affected in some way. Whether yeah. There's something you know or something you've heard about. Yeah. Can I think for like just a second? Yeah. Because there's so many. How this encounter with the Holy Spirit started is um, a group of students didn't want to stop worshiping and then they received the Holy Spirit in honesty and in genuineness and um, they started sharing their testimonies and then it didn't stop. I walked um, into the chapel and saw a bunch of students um, worshiping together very um, intimately. It just, everyone was crying, hands were in the air. It was just showcasing the love of God in so many ways that I had kind of forgotten about. And um, I remember I was with a friend and we were standing in the doorway and I turned to him and I said, I don't know what they have, but whatever it is, I want this. Our world is dark and our students are hurting and they're they're lonely, they're angry, they're desperate. And so they've been praying for change. And we've had a lot of great moments on our campus, great chapel services, great speakers, great intentionality, great prayer meetings. And I think after the service on this just regular chapel day, God just started working in their hearts and he's been working in their hearts, but they were obedient to it. You know, when you think about how did this start? Um, it was nothing anybody did. It was nothing Asbury did. It was nothing that Zach Meercreeps did. It was nothing that any student did. Um, you know, I believe that it was just a, like a pure and a deep cry for more of God's spirit that these students had. And look where it's gotten us. And so we have people from all over the world now. I was one of the people who stayed um, immediately after the chapel service. So we had kind of a soft ending. Um, we said people are allowed to continue to worship, um, but I just, I just continue to sit in my seat and pray and just reflect on who God was. Um, 
went to my 12 o'clock class, and then when I got out of class, I heard the singing, and I said, okay, that's, that's weird. Why is this still continuing? Um, so I went back up, and it, it was surreal. The peace that was in the room um, was unexplainable, and a couple of buddies and I just went to run around to the different classrooms and barged in on classes and said, revival's happening. There's been a ton of healing from church hurt and from various traumatic events. There's physical healings, there's been calls that cancer's gone, but then beyond that, something that's, like, I think extremely incredible is, I know this campus very well, it's small, we're less about, I guess, at a thousand students, and I know exactly which people on this campus hate each other, and those are the people that I have seen praying together, singing together, hugging, crying. Like, I myself have had a list of least favorite people at this school, and I have spent the week with them, and it's been, like, totally life-changing. For some, it is freedom for the first time, freedom from anxiety, freedom from uh, desperation, maybe. Uh, for some, it's freedom from addiction or whatever that may be. And for others, it might be a first-time commitment or really a first-time understanding of who God truly is. I mean, for some, they're just praying for their families that addiction would be broken in the lives of their family members. So it is however the Lord is working in their individual hearts. God has a plan of redemption for our world, but God works in the lives of people and He can bring healing and He can bring peace in the, in the midst of really challenging and difficult things. He's reaching out to a lost and broken people and He's inviting them into His presence and into His peace and into His love and community here on campus and people just can't get enough of it. I feel like the first couple of days I've just felt so much joy. like. When I'm singing, I just can't help but like, like my mouth hurts, my jaw hurts, and just smiling ear to ear, um, and just being filled with so much joy. And I've never really liked praying out loud in front of people, but I just felt so like bold in that, like to pray for people and allowing God to use me, just to speak through me to people for what they need to hear. I used to have a really big shame about prayer. I used to, um, I never used to want to pray near people, pray out loud. Um, I had a big shame about how I sounded when I prayed. I thought I had to sound like this perfect pastor with these poetic words. That rooted itself in me at a young age, and uh, Jesus like just broke that shame of how I felt and like, and how I had put my personal image above what Jesus says about me. And Jesus says that I'm his son and I'm beloved. And that my purpose in this life is to just love him and to praise him. People have been reminded about the goodness of God. And that his presence is special. That it's holy. And I think a lot of the transformation has been refocusing on Jesus. And some people have gotten healed. And some people have come to Christ which are things we celebrate, but I think a lot of the times we are just so caught up in our schedules that we forget that God is always moving, and I think He's starting to intervene here. I really think that this is just a, uh, my generation and all generations just crying out for truth um, in a world that teaches relative truth and that there is no truth. There is absolutely truth. He is truth. truth. There is truth in His Word, and He's, he's answering our prayers. This isn't just going to end and everything's going to go back to normal. Like This is changing our culture, this is changing our society, this is changing our world. The Holy Spirit's here and it's incredible what we're all learning. And Our younger generation, I'm only 18 years old and I feel like that this opportunity now has created a way of the type of man that I want to be and the type of person that I want to contribute to society and I feel like that's what's happening, that we're, we're learning all these good lessons and bonding so much with the Holy Spirit that it, this is creating a new wave of all young people that are going to impact our country and the world. You can experience revival in, in any place. It doesn't have to be in a chapel. It doesn't have to be you know, in church. It's something that you can experience every day in your life. The Holy Spirit is not contained to one place. It's not fake. It's something that's real. And it's truly why we say taste and see that the Lord is good. You can't truly understand it until you actually come and taste and see for yourself. I mean, I've seen like people be healed this week. I've never thought I'd ever see that in my life. Like, we're not worshiping the healing. Like, that's great. And if God chooses to heal, that's amazing. And it's beautiful and wonderful. But we're worshiping the one who does heal. I mean, there's going to be commissioned services where we say, thank you for coming. I'm so glad you experienced and encountered the Holy Spirit. Now go to your family, go to your school, 
go to your church, go to your community, and tell them about it, and pray for them, and it's going to happen there too. So while it will fizzle at Asbury, because it simply must at some point, uh, I think that it will be global for a very, very long time. I think that video shows and says a lot about what had taken place at Asbury. If we compare it to what we looked at today, what an outpouring is. But why I wanted to show that video is to, to ask us as a church, to, to ask, do we need God to do a work personally in each and every one of us? And within our church and within our town and within our province and within our country, to the extent that we see there. Is there any of us who do not need the Spirit's power at work in us, convicting us of sin, helping us to reconcile with others, helping us to forgive, but letting us overflow with joy in the Lord daily? Can God do what he had done there and is doing across the world here within us in Squamish? I don't think I have to answer that. I think we know what the answer is. And so as we move into communion, I think it's an opportunity again for each one of us to examine our hearts and to do business with God, to to partake in communion As a result of your faith in Jesus Christ and the forgiveness for your sins. But then to ask him to fill you. To ask him to come and fill you to overflow. So that your life will be a testimony. So that he will do a work in you. So that whatever shame there is, whatever it is that keeps you from wanting to be open about your faith, that that will flow naturally as a result of His goodness. And I want to invite you that after we have had communion and ended with uh, worship songs, if you, if you have never experienced the Holy Spirit's power in your life, if you have never been prayed over for the filling of the Holy Spirit, but you have put your faith in Jesus and you have seen in your life that, listen, There's the same pattern over and over. You are stuck in the same sin. I want to encourage you to come to the front for prayer. Uh, Us as elders that are here, Kevin, myself, Gavin, and Joey, we'll be available. But come for prayer. This is an opportunity for us to, to rest in what God wants to do. And then lastly, I just want to encourage us again. This is part of the season of prayer and fasting. And, and I just want to encourage us as a church to see God's face, to seek His kingdom first, and not just an outcome, not just an answer. And to trust if He is going to pour out His Spirit on us as a church, the rest will follow. We don't have to work things and make things happen. So I'm just going to pray for us and then invite Gavin Uh, to the front who will lead us in communion. And I think the worship band can come to the front too. Let's just bow our heads. Father, we thank you for your spirit. We thank you that your spirit is always on the move and at work. And we thank you for what you are doing. Lord, not just what you have done in the last couple of weeks at Asbury, but Lord, what you're doing in the rest of the world. Uh, We are so sheltered from China Middle East, Russia, God, all we see in the media is just everything except for the truth of how you are currently reviving your church. And Lord, you want to usher in a great harvest in these last days. And so, Lord, we come and pray 
Come and do a mighty work in us by your Spirit. We ask for, for you to in this time, through this prayer and fasting season, Lord, come and meet us. Come and show yourself to be who we know you are, the only living God. So I thank you for that. We, we bless your name. Amen.